Welcome back to the Silicon Valley Business Intelligence. And today I am delighted to introduce to you my very special guest. And I cannot introduce him without having a smile on my face. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, entrepreneur, and a very, very well accomplished lawyer, Mr. Yankee Permuter. Mr. Yankee, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Victor. It's always good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot meet this time in person, but I hope next time when you visit California, um, we will definitely do another session of interviews with you on each topic. Yeah, absolutely. In the show, we focus on entrepreneurship, uh, startups, um, and those who are relocating their businesses or expanding overseas. I'm sure that you worked a lot with people like that. What was your experience? Let's have the first like general question. Yeah, so we've helped a lot of startups, um, established companies from around the world and all different types of entrepreneurs who are moving to the U.S. either to expand their business, establish new businesses, maintain an investment, and we assist them with getting their visas and getting their um, immigration status in place from temporary visas to permanent residency. Which challenges did you face the most when you work with entrepreneurs? if they're in the startups or relocating or expanding, uh, which challenges did you face? So there are multiple challenges across industries. Generally, the, the biggest challenges are, are for startups is paperwork. Because when you're starting your company, you're, you're focused on your product, you're focused on your service, and you're not focused on the legal part of your business. It's not really... You're doing. You're you're making sure you're doing everything correctly, but you're not keeping good. You're not. People aren't keeping their records intact, and so it's it's going back and digging through digging through a company's records and an entrepreneur's um, paper trail to gather the evidence that the that the Department of Homeland Security requires for the process. That's one of the big challenges, and timing is the other big challenge because you never. You can't, you can't guarantee how long it's going to take Department of Homeland Security to process a petition. And so since we don't know, we, entrepreneurs are moving quickly. They're, they're, they're fast, it's a fast paced group of people that are constantly growing and constantly doing amazing things. They're not used to having to wait for a government organization to act. And so that that's a big that's a challenge as well for, for the entrepreneurs is getting is, is the timing of, of filing and visa issuing and all that stuff when we talk about the paperwork uh what types of documents do you usually require them to have and what, where is the challenge is it in marketing is it in promotion is it in contracts which which parts are missing contracts invoices um establishing a record of, of, of just that the business is established, bank statements, um, tax returns, corporate documents such as bylaws and oper operating agreements, marketing material, promotional material. They might use promotional material and then once the promotion is over, they, they, they don't have it anymore. But those, those documents are for an immigration petition can be very important. Um, what changed uh, within the last five or, I don't know, 10 years in your practice? Did it become more um, difficult, challenging, or it's loosened up right now uh, in terms of this type of paperwork? So we've seen, we've seen a big shift about five years ago when, in 2017 when President Trump came into office. There was a big push against international, international business moving into the US and immigration was, was sort of curtailed. And so it was a very harsh environment for entrepreneurs. And in 2016, they had established what's called the Entrepreneurial Parole Program, where a startup with VC, with VC commitments of 250,000 or 500,000 could get a um, parole visa for the founders outside of, of general immigration programs so they can get the, 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 by showing that they have funding and that they've created a, pro, a product or service, the startup could get funding. So that's, that came into place in 2016. It was stopped in 2017 by the Trump administration and it's been working its way through the courts for the past five years to see if we can get it back. 
because it's a very valuable program for, let's say if you're a student at a university and you're developing a, an application of some sort or some software development, your company is a, is a, has some, a, a startup of that nature, there wasn't really any, any visa that could fit that category. You couldn't do an intercompany transferee because you, you weren't moving from overseas. You were, you were already here in the U.S. This was an avenue for these types of startups that are built in the U.S. to stay in the U.S. It was a very, very, very smart program. And so, um, but the Trump administration had removed that program. And, and for the tech startup industry, it's, it's important that we get it back. And so there's lawsuits going on right now trying to get those back. Even though technically the program still exists, they haven't adjudicated one case yet on it. So they haven't given any visas out to, to any startups in that category. So we could try, but well, who knows? Who knows? But that's a unique that's a unique thing that's going on right now. And then as far as other changes go, over the past seven years, we've had this roller coaster of very friendly immigration environment to the business and startup community leading up to 2017 to four years of a very hostile environment for startups and entrepreneurs, even though the new case, there's new case law. So, so Denasser is a case at the BIA that impacted entrepreneurs in the national interest waiver category. So it, it, because these types of startups benefit the national interest of the U S and so it helped create a segment and we've been successful in, with hemp entrepreneurs and other types of startups that have that are that have patents or any type of extraordinary ability connected to their startup, that we've been we've been successful in getting them green cards. That that has been a change in the past couple of years as well for these types of so there's for these types of, of entrepreneurs and businesses and industry startup types of of individuals. There's a lot of opportunity. Everyone has a different story, so we can tell the story the way, the way it needs to be told for them to get their visa or green card. That is very interesting. Um, that leads me to you know uh, another question. Um, while working on uh, my American Family TV series, I uh, work with a few um, pretty successful in 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 their ways um, uh, alumni of the top universities, including Stanford and and the others. Um, and what I saw that they, even though they have this education from the top grand school, they don't know much about taxes, about how to do the uh, bookkeeping, payrolls, taxes in general, how to open a company. Um, I assume, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that sometimes it might also happen with the people who are developing whatever project they do or they come from overseas, they might not know how to do all these things and they are important. Uh, how do you deal with these situations if they exist? This is an excellent question because a lot of our entrepreneurs and in, in foreign national investors who are very, ex or very good businessmen and, and innovative and, and creative don't always know their way around the business sense of their, of their accomplishments. And so the important thing is, is that you want professionals to do the jobs that they do well. So you want to find a good accountant to help with your accounting and your tax filing because they'll have the expertise that you need. And it's not so much, you can't, you can't, you can't do everything yourself. That's what I like to tell my clients is even though they're accomplished, they're very, very smart. They want to control everything. And then you can't. The same way I have an expertise in, in business immigration and, and investment immigration. I tell my clients, you have to find a good accountant, a good business lawyer, if that's what you need. Outside of the general business law that we can assist with in our processing of petition, corporate, corporate setup and those kind of things, we'll do at our office. But in general, it's finding the professionals that you can work with, that you could, you could rely on. The same thing like any other employee. How did you, your office, how did you work with, uh, with these uh, entrepreneurs, startupers uh, who are, you know, opening companies right here in the States? Did your office open companies for them? Um, did you help them to, to do all the processes or you just refer them to other, other lawyers? So it, de it, it depends on the complexity of the deal, right? 
because sometimes you have startups that are just a single member LLC. It's one person. They have a, a very a very straightforward corporate entity set up. We'll do, we'll help we'll assist with those. Um, creating an articles of incorporation, filing the papers with Secretary of State of the of Incorporation. When you get into complex partnerships, you want to have an uh, an expert on those partnerships prepare those documents. Because like I tell the like I tell my clients, everyone is happy at the beginning. Partners are always, they're always every no one wants to sign any exit strategy documents at the beginning. But that's exactly when you need to sign exit strategy documents. When everybody's happy, when everybody's ready to deal. Because if you're getting ready to close the entity and sue each other, that's not the time to start thinking about what we should have done at the beginning. And you want an experienced business lawyer to prepare those types of documents at the get-go. How, how do we dissolve this business if it doesn't work out? That's a very important point. Um, have you witnessed such uh, events when people had to um, file a business divorce, let's call it this way, and they sue each other and then sue the company? How did it go? Yeah, I, it happens all the time. Unfortunately, business is risk and some risks don't work out. And it's, at the end, it, it's, it's, it's hurtful. People that were very close friends become enemies. People that loved each other start, hate, start to hate each other. And it's all, it's greed, right? And at the end of the day, everyone loses. It never comes out where there's a clear, one person wins and one person loses. They, everyone loses money, everyone loses opportunity. With things that could have been handled at the beginning when we had an exit strategy, a buyout plan, a payout plan, it would have been, it's, when it's clear at the beginning, there's no problems. But we've seen it definitely where people have lost millions of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fighting um, over nothing. In the US, it's a pretty common practice that people sue each other. They sue companies, they sue each other. Companies sue people, sue companies. Um, and I read that having an LLC is a good way of protecting yourself, your own assets versus the company's assets. How does that mechanism work? Absolutely, it's, a, it's mandatory. If you're starting a business, you have to have either an LLC or a corporation. It protects yourself. It's a layer of, of, it's a layer of indemnity. So it separates you, you create, you create this own, you create a unique entity, the LLC, and that LLC does all the business. And so if the business becomes liable for something, you are not personally liable. The, the, the LLC maintains liability. And it's very important. If there's, if there's, if there's things that happen, you, I mean, if you take out, a, if, the, if you have in, outstanding invoices that don't get paid or anything like that, where the company is liable, you're insulated from that liability. And so there are ways to what, what they call pierce the veil of limited liability, but it's very, very difficult for, for um, LLC to be, for the veil to be, to be pierced, to, to break through into personal liability, unless you've done some f fraud or some other type of illegal activity. You can't hide behind an LLC with fraud. I see. Um, Mr. Yankee, have you ever worked with any startups as their, um, I don't know, advisor or contract lawyer um, by taking them you know, through this path and getting them ready for uh, pitching to the VCs or to, to get their um, uh, portions of investments? So my focus is immigration law. And so I've worked with startups through that process in the immigration context. But in general, in business startup and pitching to VCs, I've reviewed contracts before, but it's not something I do regularly. But it happens. It does happen. And in the immigration context, it's important because your investment coming from the VC could impact visa applications. That's where my involvement comes in. Is if the foreign national is seeking a immigration benefit through their startup, there's 
the 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 petition is going to include what kind of what kind of VC funding they've gotten and and what kind of what kind of backing they have because it's clear evidence of their of their sustainability from your practice from your own experience um to which areas or states of the United States uh, do you see more businesses uh, and uh, entrepreneurs are immigrating right now? Well, I have, a, I have a limited snapshot. We're just one firm. But um, South Florida, a lot of people are going down there. I mean, Silicon Valley is still the place where everyone's going. That's where people want to be. But there's, but there's, there's, I, I, we're, we're seeing our entrepreneurs move to all kinds of places. I mean, we had a company just now, they decided Charlotte, North Carolina was the place for them. And they, they have a great company. They're a great startup. They're moved here from overseas and, they, and they're doing a lot of great work, but they, they wanted to, they, they started off in Southern California and then moved to Charlotte. And we have companies moving to Austin, Texas is, 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 is a big startup town, but every, everywhere, every city is trying to, attract startups. I, I recommend startups if you're if you're if you're if you've launched and you're ready to go and you have something, take advantage of the cities wanting to pull people in. They'll offer free rent, they'll offer offer they'll, they'll, you can get incentives out of cities to move there. And uh, from your practice, which cities are offering those um, incentives? I know Cincinnati was, Cincinnati, Ohio. I know uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. A lot of the Midwest towns, Kansas City, Kansas City. There are cities. Um, I, I I think Atlanta stopped doing it, but you don't need to be Amazon to get a city to give you something for moving there. Cities cities are looking for startups. They have, all have incubators that'll help fund things. They all there's if, if you have if you have if you're if you're in a good and, and they have funders, they have VCs. Every city has their own their own set of VCs. I mean the big cities, New York, LA, San Francisco, have the most money. But you can get a lot of money out of out of uh, Des Moines, Iowa or St. Paul, Minnesota. On which portals or, um, I don't know, information websites uh, could the entrepreneurs find this information to, to see what is this particular city offering? You'd want to go to the, to the city's um, workforce website. So most cities, if you go to the city website, you should be able to find some sort of like work, working opportunities link or... And you probably you might have to dig pretty deep to find it, but they're smart people. You should you could find it. Last week we had an interview with a, a co-founder of Oculus, and um, he uh, shared with us that um, the U.S. does not produce enough uh, engineers or technical specialists. That's why there are so many uh, people coming and uh, developing as engineers. Um, I assume, but please correct me if I'm wrong, they are working on uh, H-1B visas. How is the situation with uh, the students, with the uh, H-1B applicants uh, right now in this domain, in, in business? Yeah, I, excellent. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a very important question right this moment because we're entering into H-1B season. So the H-1B is the most oversubscribed visa. There's going to be... There's 80,000 available, 80, about, about 85,000 available every year. And there's been, every year there's been about 200 to 250 applications for the past 10 years. So there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of people that don't get those visas. Um, but they're trying to modernize the process. We're hoping, we continuously hope that Congress will act and allow for more visa availability in the H-1B category. But the stu students need to what they what what I recommend to any student right now in the tech in the in the in the information systems or or any tech role that's hoping for an H one B, you want to get your application you want to apply early because you want to have multiple shots at the lottery because there's a lot of there's, there's a lottery 
That's going to March is March will open registration. And then March 30, 30th, the lottery will happen. And then April 1st or April 2nd, we'll start seeing who gets selected and who gets the visa. And so in your last year of university, you should definitely be approach, approaching employers, getting out there and getting, and getting your name on, a, on, a, on some sort of, of uh, payroll or get an offer for H-1B registration so that your second year, if you get selected, then you're good to go. If you don't get selected, the next year you get OPT, you could you could work and you'll have another opportunity you'll have another shot at the at the um, lottery and then if you get if you're in the stem which you should be if you're in if you're in technology then you could get two years of opt so then you'll have a third shot a lot of people can't tell you how many times i hear from people who they wait until their last year of opt and they only get one shot at the at the lottery get in early Except of uh, H-1Bs, uh, what other options might they consider? So that's also that's also a good question because they're, 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 the other options are pretty limited. And so really the, is going right to a green card. But that would take the petitioner, your employer, petitioning for you. And they'd have to get that started very, very early because it takes 18 months to get through that process. And so... If that's a route you want to take, if that's a route your company, your employer is willing to go through with you, you want to start that immediately upon graduation, if not sooner. While you're, so that while you're on OPT, your labor certification is going through, that could take a year or more. What about visas as um, L1 or L1? So if you're in the US, it's going to be hard to qualify for an L1 because the L1 intercompany transferee requires a one-year employment at the company overseas. An O-1, an O-1's, O-1's the, so the O-1 is the extraordinary ability visa, and that's gonna be very case specific. There's no generalities to the, you know, H-1Bs are very, are very standard, you know. Specialty occupation, we can tell right away if the company will qualify, if the employee will qualify. O-1s, like the EB1A are going to require, there's, you can't really generalize answers to those kind of questions. So you have to, the individual is going to have to, going to tell you. Hey, um, Mr. Yankee, there was a time when uh, you decided to start your own company, uh, to start your own business, uh, you know, versus going uh, to someone else's firm and being an employee. Um, how did that happen? How did you start your own business? I started my legal legal career working for um, in the staffing industry and we were we were bringing we were assisting with visa visa applications for nurses and i i i had always known i would be my own boss one day and it just felt the right time to start my law firm and that's what i did how did you keep growing? You know, to start a company is not a difficult thing. You just file a few papers and then you have a legal entity, but then building your name, clientele, keeping it above the water and then expanding. How did it happen? What did you do? What steps did you take? I, social media marketing and building a network. And the network is just, and doing a good job. Success is, success breeds success as they say. And so it took, it took, a, it took a long time to build up a, ne a network of people knowing who we are, what we did. We do a very niche, we do a very niche type of law. In the, in the realm of legal work, we do a very minute part of it, business immigration. And we're very, very good at that one thing. And I think focusing on being the best at, at what we do helped us gain that reputation and people talk about it, but getting, getting out there, going to conferences, being online, telling every person I walk into, everybody I bump into about what I do, 
I did that for a long time. And then it, it, it's a it's a snowball. Well, it, it pays, pays off. off. Yeah, I definitely recommend Warren Buffett's biography, Snowball, because he okay. talks about that. Everything you you don't do anything like this. Nothing goes like this. Every small step leads you to the next to the next step to the next step. Mr. Yankee, thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing your tips, your advice. I appreciate it a lot, and can't wait to. Meet you next time here in California and uh, continue our interview with you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I, it's always a pleasure seeing you. I, Thank you. Put a smile on my face, man. Mm-hmm.